I'm Andrea Peak. I'm the community coordinator in Pasco County, Florida, and I have the pleasure of working with Judge Lynn Tepper. Um, the reason why I got into this work was from walking into her courtroom. The trauma-informed courts are so, so important to what we do. Um, it is just a huge, vast difference in walking into a trauma-informed court, and what all of these judges are doing is really, really important to the work that we do with our families and our children. Once you see the difference and you know the difference, you can't go back. So this is how I got into early childhood court or Safe, Baby, Safe Babies Court teams. I want to give these judges as much time as possible to share all of their wisdom and information with you, so I'm gonna skip the whole bio section and just go ahead and introduce each judge. We have Judge Lynn Tepper, who will be helping moderate the session today from Pasco County, Florida. Judge jo Joseph Seidlin from Iowa. Judge Kim Todd from Pinellas County here in Florida. Judge Mary Polson in Florida. Judge Doris Francine from Oklahoma. And oh yeah, we got some Oklahoma in here. And of course, Judge Judge Broom from Mississippi. So it is a great honor to introduce all of these judges. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Judge Tepper. Thank you. All right. Good morning. You might have noticed in your written program that there was a different description, and we referenced it as trauma audits. But we discovered in communicating with a variety of stakeholders and people that the word trauma is actually a trigger because what it reflects for many people and some communities is that they've, they've, they've often felt they've been under a microscope of being, they have to be bared for the sake of somebody else's purpose. And that's a trigger. And we, it took us a while last night to review what we're really talking about and to do away with anything that would be triggering because we understand and we hope to communicate to you that words matter words that are used, whether it's from the bench or from our practice. And that's how we transformed into a trauma-informed practice consultation. So forgive us if by accident we use the word audit, but I do hope you'll take out your pen and paper and that as we share how we have begun to change and implement trauma-informed practices that you're going to be going, ah, this happens in my office, this happens in my courthouse, why can't I change that? This is what I'm going to do on Monday or start another list that's going to say long-term plans on what you can do. And I urge you to have a vision of what you can do and an action plan by the time you walk out of here. And the reason that this is important for every one of us who are in the zero to, to five population particularly is because the people that are walking into our lives, into our courtrooms, into our offices, have all suffered this from others. They don't need to be shamed by us. They don't need to, to be unsupported. In other words, we have a need to truly find out what we can do to implement trauma-informed practices. So, you wanna go know what in the world is a trauma-informed consultation. We're gonna tell you that very briefly and then we're gonna get feedback from judges who have had a consultation. And so, how are they conducted? What are they looking at? Uh, the lessons that have learned from them? And what can you individually, when you return to your areas do? And what have they already begun to do, do in response to what may have occurred a year ago for me in 2014 and then in 2016, and what they may have already done even from a month ago. So you see, change can happen. And of course, we want to be aware, as a result of what we are learning from our consultations, whether or not there is indeed implicit bias that's going on in our courtroom. In other words, as we look at the results, is the issue that we see the result of our own implicit bias, implicit bias of others who are stakeholders, and then what, are, what is the effect of that bias? And what strategies can we in, in start in our communities, in our courts, to be sure that we're reducing that implicit bias? So take a look at this. This is a long list. I'm not going to read all of it to you. But the, one of the important pieces is the physical environment. 
is going to be part of such a consultation. So make, and of course this will all be uploaded onto zero to three so you can see this and take it back to your group, whether it's the stakeholders or whether it's within your clinical surroundings or whether it's in your courthouse to see if there are some issues. Go, go be your client, go be a party that's coming to court and sit out there. Judge Fronstein, you tried that. What was your experience in going out after your consultation and, and just sitting there like you were a party? I had heard a great deal. I, you have to understand our facility is horribly inadequate, but we're getting a new facility in about a year and a half. It'll be built and structured in a far more humane um, and trauma-informed way. Um, so I stayed out of our horribly crowded waiting area where there were as many as 40 to 50 clients at one time with bailiffs who screamed out their names or told them to be quiet or sheriff's deputies who liked to arrest people. And I had heard about this and so finally one afternoon, I, I didn't have a docket, I don't know how that happened, but anyway. And I literally sat at the front entrance which our waiting area and such is much smaller, maybe one-fifth of this room, um, and watched the deputy's treatment of individuals and, more importantly, children, picking them up, manhandling them, screaming them at them, telling them to sit down and shut up, um, and I was horribly uh, astounded as to how bad it was, and it is much better now. Um, so it is critical <clears throat> to be a judge incognito um, and just mingle so that you can see how the people are treated before they walk into the courtroom and then you wonder why they may be so dysregulated when they walk in. Important information, easy to take home. Now there are other parts of the site visit that are going to include obviously court observation, as you can see, and they do. They are, they're, you'll see that there'll be eventually. You'll get some um, question. You'll get the results of questionnaires and observations as to the percentage of times that a judge did such and such engaged a party, called them properly by their name, and then of course there are the interviews and the surveys. There are pre. Uh, consultation surveys as well, and you'll get all the results of that. And it is, it's incredible the impact it can have on you in a positive way. It's not about what, I, interestingly, you know, we talk about, we're not going to ask, what did you do wrong? It's about what happened to you? So what's going on in your courtroom that's happening? And how did we, how did I not look through a trauma lens and realize, oh my goodness, how could I have let this happen in my courthouse? So it's an invaluable lesson because the courthouse, the areas where individuals come, in greater detail I wanted to share with you what we have to be aware of. Because don't forget, not only are they impacted by how they're treated by security, which is something that there's no reason they shouldn't be trauma informed, but other personnel. And one of the criticisms in mine in 2014 is we're busy doing DV hearings, very important to the parties, and I got Um, in your courtroom. Oh, I, I apologize. I wonder if any of the judges on the panel have found in their courtroom that they, there's distractions that are going on and the mood in the courtroom is inappropriate for that bailiff to walk in or for that assistant, uh, the attorney for child welfare to be having a different type of conversation or mood or private conversations or trying to talk to clients in the back of the courtroom and things like that and a lack of privacy and respect. Anybody want to respond to that? Judge Seidlin? Yeah, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> Is it on? Yeah? On? Yeah. Awesome. I think that uh, what I've experienced um, isn't so much the, uh, you know, the bailiff or the court attendant uh, carrying on other business. What I experience and that, that, that I have a hard time dealing with because I don't try to be a nice guy, but uh, is the attorneys and the, court, uh, the juvenile court officers in delinquency cases, but uh, or the GALs, uh, the second that your hearing is over with, uh, move on. Uh, 
to what happened last night, what happened yesterday, what's going to happen tomorrow. And we could have just gotten through the most solemn hearing. And the second that I say we're adjourned, they start laughing about something. And uh, they don't intend anything by it. And one of our most guilty uh, culprits has been uh, a prosecuting attorney doing safe babies court for you know a dozen years and still gets caught up in it and uh, it's something that has constantly happened to be a reminder uh, kindly that uh, and you, you don't want to do it while the, the clients are still in the room you don't want to dress down the, 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 the litigants the, the, the professionals in front of the clients but it's something that you have to constantly be reminding yourself. Because if there's a client still in the courtroom, they think you're laughing at them. Exactly. They're hyper vigilant. Yeah. Anybody else want to address that piece? Okay. But if you also notice, we're talking about the overall communication. Often the bench control is in charge and can set the tone. And, and that is trying to appear, we're, we're trying to build trust. So it's not building trust when every time you come into the courtroom and leave, it seems like everybody must be talking about you or laughing about you. But when you come into the courtroom, if you're gre the way in which you're greeted by the bench, the way you're greeted by case managers can make a difference. How are you doing today? So how's the week been? And we've talked about that in some of the other sessions about how to engage a parent. And that's how we can start to build trust when they recognize that it's not about what they did wrong and that we actually are focused there and that we're there for them. Because what we want to do is encourage them to be candid when they leave here and speak to the, whether it's the infant mental health specialist, whether they're talking to their mental health specialist, we need them to know that we're not going to abuse that. And so privacy becomes an issue. We're going to talk about how we might manage that in a better way, and um, timelines and scheduling can have a lot to do with that. I did want to show you an example for those of you who haven't had a, a, a trauma practice informed, a trauma informed practice consultation yet. This is just an example of one of the grids that you might end up with. And it really causes you to take a good look at it and say, wait a minute, am I failing to engage this person or am I failing to do this because I'm assuming that based on their gender or based on their race, they're probably not interested, they don't want to hear about this or whatever assumption. But I have to analyze it and then I have to look at it from their perspective. One of the things I just want to point out quickly in terms of the impact of implicit bias in scheduling. Um, for instance, this wasn't a zero to five court circumstance, but I did a DV docket and we would had way we, we would call cases, you know, the ones that had the respondent didn't appear and then the ones that were uncontested and then the ones with attorneys and then the ones at the end that had no attorneys but it was contested and had witnesses. Except that at the end I would notice, why was it always a minority? family that seemed to be last on my docket. That had an impact on them, I realized from their perspective. And then we rearranged things and we would never leave an unrepresented minority uh, family last on the docket. It's the impression that we have to be aware of the impact. So now we'll talk about recommendations that most of us had found we were the recipient of as a result of our, our consultation. Obviously, the first one, the adoption of a universal precaution, what we're talking about is presuming trauma of everybody that walks through our doors. That one a, should be a given, a no-brainer for everybody. But let's talk a little bit more about the um, whether or not those of you who had it, your uh, consultation a year ago or back in May, um, who would like to address any of these shared recommendations that we've had that are up there? Uh, whether it's the trauma screening protocol or surveys of, of participants. Judge Polson? So I had my audit in June right before Father's Day weekend. And so I really want to say, just, diverse, just to digress just a little bit, so this talk is really about when Sarah comes to visit you. So um, <laughs> does everybody know who Sarah is, who does these? Where is Sarah? Sarah, stand oh, up. There she is. So everybody will see Sarah. <laughs> Sarah Ray, National Council. So very quickly, this is not on the, on the slides, but when Sarah comes to visit you, if you live, if you are at the beach, number one, put her in a hotel at the beach because she loves the beach. 
Number two, get some of your best stakeholders to go out to dinner because she likes dinner and drinks. So I just, that's just, those are other recommendations, okay? Um, not to influence her, but just so you can spend some quality time with her outside the, the assessments. Okay, so anyway, so I was very interested because as a judge, I can't sit in on the staffings, the team meetings and the parent meetings before they come to court. So what we did in my court after going to Iowa in 2015, we changed it all to one day. And we thought we were doing a really good thing in doing that because our parents have a hard time getting off from work and transportation. So we said if we can do it all on one day, twice a month, so half the cases come on one day on a Friday and the others come on the other Friday of the month. And we started 8.30 in the morning with the team staffing from 8.30 to 10.30. Then they take a short break and eat their lunch. They usually bring lunch in for the team. And then the parents come in and they do staffings from 11.30 to 1.30 and then we start court. Well, when Sarah came to visit us on our day in June, we had a, a high number of cases, 14. So that's 14 cases to staff in two hours with the parents, it's a lot. You know, we usually we try to have no more than 10. And what I learned from Sarah is that, I also learned that some of my attorneys don't get along. Can you imagine that? <laughs> and they sort of snap at each other and disagree. And if they can't figure it out, instead of problem solving, they just say, we'll let the judge decide. And they do that in front of the parents sometimes. So we're working on that, all right? We're working on building our team. but. She said that there was a lot of time spent with just the team, the professionals without the parents, and then it was very rushed when the parents were there. And so she felt like they didn't have time to actually spend time problem solving with the parents, and then we were rushed in court. And so what she recommended is that we go to four Fridays. Well, that's not gonna go over now, okay? So we've, we've talked about that. But she also recommended eliminating that first staffing without the parents and become totally transparent and just start out with the parents there and not have to repeat what's being said. And that's what we're going to do. The second thing is that we don't have any place for parents or even attorneys or, or participants to eat in our courthouse. We don't have a snack bar. We don't even have a coffee machine. I mean, we, you know, that's open to the public. We have vending machines with no coffee. Can you imagine that? I mean, so um, we, I said, well, you know what? In Hawaii, I'm looking at the Hawaiian judge. I can't pronounce his name, but they feed their parents when they come to court. I said, why can't we do that in Florida? They can do it in Hawaii. Why can't we do it? And I feed so them we, in my court we, You know, and you feed them. Healthy so snacks we, we and have condoms, implemented but. an idea to do sack lunches for the parents and everybody eat with the parents while they're staffing. And they've done it once, not in my court, but um, my community coordinator has done it in Pensacola and we're going to bring it in. So thank you, Sarah, so much for your recommendations. We're looking forward to implementing them. Anything else about scheduling um, that you on this, the generally common recommendation that you got? Or in, um, w Originally, when Sarah was going to come to our courthouse in Pinellas County, I thought it was just going to be for early childhood court. But fortunately, she it's for the, everything. I, it wasn't what I thought it would be. I mean, it was from outside and the security when they come in the building to the cafeteria to the other courtrooms and so and your detention center and detention center correct and so for for me the biggest the biggest thing that stuck out in my mind was it was that um in the mornings every every day of the week we have detention hearings and shelter hearings and she pointed out that um, a lot of times the people that are waiting from the shelter hearing are sitting in the courtroom because we have open courtrooms in, in florida and while the detention hearings are going on. So they're seeing all these kids that are being brought in once in a while and, and, and shackles if they need to, if there's a reason for it. And, or me saying 21 days or whatever it is for detention and the shelter people who don't, the, the families are for shelter who don't even really are confused about why they're there anyway are seeing something completely different. So her recommendation for that was to make sure that we um, make sure those families are outside until we complete the um, detention hearings and then we bring in the And also families. schedule them separately. Instead, everybody said right. at one hour to shift the time. There can be very simple right. solutions once you become aware of what the right. problem is. Right. And on some of the other common recommendations, does anybody want to address the change in the physical plant and making it more child friendly, uh, both the courthouse and the courtroom? Judge, uh, Judge uh, go ahead, sure. Judge Room. Uh, 
Well, in our courthouse in Mississippi, we had just uh, constructed a new uh, building in 2011. And uh, of course, when you get low bid, you get low quality sometimes. Uh, but we actually did pretty good. The only problem is our Board of Supervisors and our funding authority uh, didn't really want to provide anything to assist us in making the environment more family friendly. Uh, so we've kind of had to be a little creative in that way and try to secure funding and think fun things uh, by sending it through the purchasing authority that we are ordering a table and chairs. It just so happens it's a miniature table and chairs for the kids. <laughs> uh, so, you know, things, things of that nature. Uh, and so when Sarah came and with Jessica Cisneros and visited us in May, we had not actually been able to secure that yet, but since then, We've been able to secure it and we're slowly getting the uh, purchases in and uh, it's been a big help for our kids who have been in our waiting area because they've had something to entertain them but it's also been educational for them because and educational for the staff because they're able to see the parents and children interact within the within the courthouse which gives them some idea of what's going on outside the courthouse uh, now the other is that uh, you know, as, as uh, Judge Todd and all said about the, the seeing the piece from the front end, uh, I know many of you are like me. You probably have security personnel that rotates or changes on a daily basis, so you don't necessarily have an appreciation who might be guarding your metal detector at any point in time. But I can just tell you that you probably should because we had an occasion recently where uh, a deputy came out to, to guard the metal detector and apparently there was someone who pulled up in the parking lot who didn't get out of their car fast enough and uh, then she went out to investigate and suddenly uh, there was a drawdown in the parking lot of the repairman for the washer and dryer in our detention facility <laughs> because he was in a oh white God. panel van without any markings on it uh, she didn't know what he was there for and thought he was up there for some ulterior purpose. And he said, well, well I'm here to fix the, the dryers in the back. She said, we don't have any dryers here. And he said, well, yes, you do. I installed two of them when we built the building. Uh, and she said, well, next time you come in the parking lot, make sure you've got a note on the van or some kind of uh, writing on the van as to what you are. So the joke around our building is that we should wear a poster board with our name <laughs> on it and what our position is so we don't get shot. Yeah. Uh, but luckily, the sheriff was understanding, and we had a gr quick, quick understanding as before we sent somebody else out there that we needed to have a little vetting process about what's going on because those things, you know, are very uh, disruptive to people who are coming in the courtroom because they're not coming there voluntarily. They're not coming for a good time. And so if you have somebody who's off-putting like that on the front end, it really affects the back end of the process as well. So I would encourage you, and one of the things that we're doing too is working on our signage and also to try and have, when I say signage, you know, directing where the courtroom is, but also have a map of inside the courtroom so that the participants know who's sitting where and where they're expected to sit because they have some anxiety as to, to where do I, where am I supposed to go? I, I may or may not have an attorney with me. What do I need to do? The last I would say is, is that if you haven't got a dog in the courtroom, a therapy dog, it doesn't even have to be a therapy dog. Just get How a dog. How many of you have therapy dogs where you work? Excellent. Excellent. We just passed a law that they're entitled to come into the courthouse. Uh, the, the dog, uh, even, even if you uh, uh, don't have a trained therapy dog, at least having a friendly dog in the courthouse is going to be of extreme benefit, not only to the children and families, it's going to be a benefit to the staff. It, it reduces your trauma as well as that of your staff because it just creates a much more friendly environment and the, the interaction between the children and the dog uh, is therapeutic to you, if nothing else. So I would strongly encourage you to do so. Um, Judge Fonstein or Judge Seidel, do you want to talk about any other changes in the physical? I don't know. I know you had yours a little bit further out, but um, that, that you noticed or have been able to implement? Well, we just moved into a new building uh, in November. And uh, uh, it just has to be closer, I think. They turned it on. Right? We moved into a new building Can you in hear? Okay. Uh, November. It was uh, a former uh, J.C. Penney's department store. 
right across the street from the uh, courthouse that we were occupying uh, that was built in 1905. And uh, don't get me wrong, it's a beautiful facility and we're very glad to have it. Uh, and uh, we are the, the juvenile court, there's six of them in Polk County, Iowa. And we're all on the second floor of this uh, building. And uh, when Sarah was getting ready to come out and visit our site, I told her that uh, literally uh, I was giving her a, uh, a blank canvas uh, to work on. Uh, our courtrooms, uh, again, beautiful, laid out very nicely. There are no windows. There's absolutely nothing on the walls, including clocks. And uh, it's all very... Uh, uh, sterile? It's very sterile and potentially... Very institutional-like? You know, or intimidating. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I ended up uh, a few months back just going to Target and getting a clock for three ninety nine and putting it on the wall. Now, I didn't do it for trauma-informed purposes. I just did it because I got sick and tired of being asked every single day, Judge, you don't have a clock in your courtroom. <laughs> but uh, what... Uh, and, and the recommendations certainly that we have to make this a more uh, child-friendly environment. We have to have things on the walls. Our, co our common space is, is large. We've got an entire area dedicated to a, a play area, but there's really nothing in it yet. And uh, I don't know if uh, this was uh, uh, good stress or tolerable stress. Whatever it was, it was the stress that wakes you up at 2 o'clock in the morning. When uh, I fin we finished with the, the, the trauma consult when Sarah left, I felt this sense of relief. Well, that's good. That's over with. And it dawned on me, well, Joe, this isn't something that you're just going to get a report and shove it in your desk drawer. You're going to have to do something with it. And uh, that's what woke me up at 2 o'clock in the morning. And we have to, I have to uh, gather, uh, convene, which I've started, group. Uh, there's about 15 individuals that are other judges, prosecutors, parents, uh, parents lawyers I mean, GALs, our CASA supervisor, uh, child welfare agency supervisors, our delinquency juvenile court officers, uh, head of our, uh, our local shelter, uh, county clerk, uh, representatives, uh, court administration representatives, mental health uh, provider agency representative to get together to dissect this uh, uh, consult, the report, and to start making changes. And I knew that I had to go across the street to the old courthouse where the district court judges are still there. And they have the keys to the court administration who has the uh, in with the county who owns our building, which we're all going to need their help in getting something on the walls or any of this stuff. And I knew I had to talk with them. Uh, so uh, I reached across the street to a, a district court judge to bring him into what we're trying to do here. She was very excited about it. And I said I was expecting this report uh, soon. And uh, all of a sudden, Friday, this last Friday, get this uh, email from a fellow judge saying, Joe, have you been out in the common area yet today? And I said, no. Well, suddenly, out of the blue, appears a bookshelf <laughs> and a couch. I wonder how that happened. So it doesn't take much to start the wheels turning, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, uh, making uh, a, lot of, a lot of good changes. Thank you. Thank you. Doris, you've ha had some yeah. good luck? Um, well, for, the, for this new building, same situation, where's all the money going to come from? But even starting in my, because I showed Lynn my pictures, um, is I wanted family-friendly pictures. We have an alternative school connected to our court. Um, and the students did beautiful paintings, black and white, of their concept of a family, which I had framed and put in my courtroom, right? no cost, they had tremendous pleasure, brought me to tears. For our new courthouse, I went to our local bar association, Tulsa County Bar Association, 
for artistic donations and planning on that. We have a girls' art school where they are grade school and middle school girls receiving art lessons from a fabulous local artist in our city. And they're going to provide a lot of the artwork for our building. Um, there's a lot of donations that can be done through the artwork. Um, I have luxury of working with my architects in our courtrooms, and we still have jury trials for these cases in Oklahoma. And his first comment is because of the cost reduction or whatever, we're not going to get light, natural light, other than there will be some sunbeams or whatever. But he said, he said, Judge, this is a juvenile court, so you have the dignity, but you need to capture the spirit of working with families and children because children need to come to court. It's about them. Um, so he saw our two little bookshelves full of toys and books that are kind of on either side of my bench. First of all, my bench is going to get lower, and there's going to be wonderful shelves with a backdrop of yellow that we can put those books and animals and stuff that covers the whole wall behind the bench. And the tiles up in the ceiling are white and blue with one yellow. The sun with the appropriate lighting. And you won't see a, there'll be paneling, but there's also certain designs and the carpeting that when you walk in, you just, ah, you feel good. And, and that's what we need to create afraid. for individuals that are already traumatized. Yeah. This is a positive place where I can feel comfortable, where children can feel comfortable. Um, I also wanted to, it's important to understand the impact of educating our stakeholders um, and anybody who is working with the courts. And that's why I wanted to um, briefly ask Judge Broom, haven't you done some planning already on getting your stakeholders trauma-informed as a result of your uh, trauma-informed practices? We have. Uh, we, uh, we, we've kind of taken the universal precaution model and tried to uh, uh, parlay it to everyone that we're dealing with, from our detention staff to our, our CPS staff, our Child Protection Services, and all of our court staff, and all of our our mental health providers and one of the things we're having is a, a trauma conference that we're trying to send a lot of people to and actually our Department of Mental Health is sponsoring it so we don't have any uh, high cost in sending people and it's local for us so we're going to be sending a high number of people to that but one of the things I would tell you that you can do uh, that doesn't really cost any money either but also gets you a lot of bang for the reward is to engage your chamber of commerce, your business community, and as well as your healthcare community, and invite them in because a lot of them will be glad to share, and they have staff on board in many of those cases that'll come in and do trainings for you. And we have a university system that's in the area, and our community colleges, and you can get those folks to come over, those master's level and PhD folks who are looking for an opportunity to share and it's great to get them in, in place because I can tell you, you know, while I see families in the courtroom and I deal with families, my staff and, and our detention staff, and they work with them much more hands-on than I do. And it's so very important that the people at the, at the lowest level, and in fact, that security staff that I was mentioning, that, that's the level you need it at because they're going to be the ones who sit in the conference area in the waiting room with them and, and can help mitigate and help work through some of those issues because I just think back to my own personal um, uh, legal practice. I had a rape victim uh, that I represented and she could not go into a conference room with a closed door. Uh, and if you tried to put her in a closed room in a courtroom or courthouse somewhere, even though she was a, a victim, she would go crazy and, uh, and I, rightfully so. And uh, I think you just have to look at all of that dynamic environment that we go through on a daily basis and ask, ask the people who are coming before you, what, what do you need to feel comfortable? What, what do you need? Do you need to bring a certain item in with you? Do you need, what, what do you need? Because and that's avoiding the re-traumatization that we may not even be aware of. They may not be aware of because they may not have the memory, but there may be something, a noise or a smell or a color that's going to trigger them if we're not 
cautious about that. Uh, Judge Paulson, were you about to add something on this area? I know I have one father who needs a hearing assisted device, you know, and we, he told us that the first time we could tell he couldn't hear in court. And so I just made a note on my docket and each time he's on there, I just make sure that my bailiff has that already ready for him. And he seems to appreciate the fact that we remember that. And you know. that does matter, and that is, again, you're supposedly getting to know them to help them, and if you actually do remember them, I keep shadow files, so I know what's a trigger and what isn't, and what may have happened, so I know, and I'll warn my bailiff, hey, look, this guy's had a lot of issues, you need to, to be cautious, and, and to make sure that you are greeting them so that they feel like at the courthouse, what's happening to them is they're going to be able to get a, a, an opportunity to recover. They're going to have a chance to get encouraged, that we are going to encourage the other generation that maybe was part of the issue to be part of the healing through the behavioral health programs in our community. Because we have gone ahead and had stakeholder meetings. In our early childhood court, we have about 10 a year, at least, uh, our early ch uh, childhood court stakeholders. But I also have a Project One court, and we also do those sometimes in co collaboration. But as uh, Judge Broom was talking about, your, in, your community is rich with resources and bring them in to help educate, or sometimes your community thinks it's trauma-informed and it isn't, so then maybe you'll be lucky enough through, through your QIC to have somebody fund a true trauma-informed trainer to come and educate for continuing ed credits for the detention staff workers, the staff at the courthouse, the personnel, the case managers, Ever, the foster parents, the guardian ad litems or CASAs, and then that is part of what you can do. But if you have a university or state college in your area, reach out to them. Since my 2014 first um, a, a trauma co consultation, they've put on two trauma conferences that get sold out. And when, after this year, when they asked, do, what do you want to do next time? They said, trauma, trauma, trauma. And so that is another resource for you to give people the day off from court, so to speak, not schedule it so that they can go. Um, I do hope that um, you understand that there are practices that were observed that were already on in place in the courts. And so it's not just about what you did wrong, but it's what you're doing right. And we have here a couple of um, notations of what has been going on in the courtrooms. And those of you who see uh, what you're particularly doing there, um, Judge, uh, why don't you talk about, Judge Todd, your icebreakers? Because those are so wonderful. Can, is it on? You keep talking, okay. it'll come up. All right, I want to, before, I, I just want to say one thing. I didn't realize this, but Sarah pointed out to me that one of the great things about this trauma assessment is you can use it to get grant money. <laughs> so um, I was going to, one of the things I was, steps I was going to take in addition to meeting with my stakeholders was to talk to my court administrator or grant writer to ask about, because we're getting a new courthouse too, and it would be nice to get some funding to do some of these wonderful things to our courthouse. But one of the things on here, icebreaker, you want me to talk about? Yeah. That? is um, what the icebreaker meetings are that we do. Um, it's uh, when there's, right now we do it in, across all the dependency cases, but for foster families and the biological parents, but in our early childhood court, we're doing it between the caregivers, the foster caregivers and biological parents or foster parents and biological parents. And what it is is shortly after the, um, after the um, child has been um, removed and placed with the um, relative caregiver or the foster family, we have somebody that sets up a meeting between the two of them. And that the hope of that is to facilitate them uh, talking more, having open communication, talking about the child, it gives the bio parents some power, you know, so that this person's taking care of their child. So what are some things that they should know? What are some things that the ways that they can communicate with one another? And so it really is a nice way, that's why they call it an icebreaker, to get them to start having a relationship with one another that hopefully we can foster throughout the case. And that actually gives some credibility, self-esteem building for the parent. Somebody's asking them, well, you know your child best. Tell me, so what's your, the favorite food of your child? Or what have you found is the best way when to, to quiet your child or something like that? It's, it's respect and it's engaging them in the process. Judge Esrick from Tampa? Who facilitates the icebreakers? It does not happen 
in court. I was going to say that it happens mm -hmm. outside of court, and it's um, it's Eckerd Community Alternatives, our community based, which is our our agency. Yeah, they're the ones. Someone, a representative from in there. essence DHS to some of you. Uh, okay, that's who facilitates it. And um, with regard to the peer, anybody have the peer parent mentors, Judge Seidel? Uh, I can't think of uh, any program that we have. We've got a lot of good programs, but the program that we have that, that parents have the opportunity to get involved in right at the beginning is our parent partner program, uh, where uh, someone who, a parent who has been through this before and who has come out okay, uh, gets trained and uh, uh, volunteers uh, and uh, is assigned to uh, uh, a, uh, a, a new parent that's going through this process right at the beginning. And uh, I don't think anything says uh, uh, or that, that we're serious about our goal of reunification, of making this okay, more than saying, we want you to be with somebody who's been through this and, and has come out okay, and we want this person to, to walk through this with you. And our parent partner program, uh, Denise Moore is our local uh, coordinator for that. I, I think she's here. And uh, uh, I don't know, were you here? Can you stand up? Just walked out. <laughs> it happens a lot when I start talking. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's a program that started in Iowa in 2007 uh, with just four uh, pilot uh, counties. And it rapidly spread to it's throughout the entire state of Iowa. And uh, it's something that uh, is constantly being nurtured. Uh, uh, parents are being recruited uh, that are successful. And I think it's a, it's a program that uh, uh, really uh, lets the parents know right off the bat that And don't your serious. peers, don't they get paid as well? Yeah, I said volunteers. Oh, but I uh, thought some of them got paid. There is some payment that's involved. There is, uh, <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's an opportunity for some of these uh, parents who have, uh, are still struggling. Uh, with economically to uh, uh, to use what they've learned and uh, uh, become part of our team. And even if you get turned down on the first attempt at this, keep at it. Just keep at it. Um, we're lucky in our area we have a, although they're not paid through the courts or what you would call DHS, our community behavioral health program has a peer mentor that works with certain types of families and we invited that team to come and educate our stakeholders about what they're doing with families, 66% of the services in their home. but. And I thought it was quite commendable that this parent had come and said 10 years earlier she had had her rights terminated, but I didn't recognize her. I had, was the one who had terminated her parental rights. And when I commended her after, the set, after she had presented, she said, you know it was 10 years ago, but it was still extremely hard. It was so hard for me to walk back into this building. So think about the number of parents you have who lost two, three, four children in that courthouse, maybe by the judge. That's what they're facing. You think they're not elevated and hypervigilant, and maybe they're not open to what's going on, so we have to be very encouraging in what we're doing. Um, I did want to also talk about the, um, you can see very obviously there are different ways to approach talking to children. We are going to show you some of the um, wonderful changes that have been made in our courthouses in terms of making them more family and child friendly. But we also wanted to talk about like how some of these little things can actually be accomplished without money. I'm a great believer of, don't give me any money, I'm just gonna get it done. And uh, back 15 years ago, before I was trauma-informed uh, by education, uh, we were renovating our courthouse and I was a judge that volunteered to get involved in the project. And so I found a little tiny, tiny room that was not going to be used in, for its former source. And so I thought, a children's waiting area. I had been down to the Miami courts where they have this massive, ch great children's area. And so I said, let's do it. And we used a juvenile that needed to do some community service, who was my, supervised by my judicial assistant, who painted the murals in there. And we didn't have any furniture because nobody was going to give me any furniture. So we got plastic milk cartons that we turned over for bookshelves, and you could sit on them. And my judicial assistant and I went to flea markets and got books. Well, then we got some publicity when our Supreme Court gave an award to my judicial assistant and I for the work we were doing. And next thing you know, ever since, the books 
and the stuffed animals just pour into the courthouse. The 4-H, one of the chapters, has me come once or twice a year. The children gather all their books and stuffed animals that they want to share. When one classroom gets a thank you note, then the next one, their sibling, goes to their classroom, and they want to donate books. And it's a wonderful community project. And then, of course, court administration was kind of shamed into buying us children child-friendly uh, furniture. Uh, but then when we needed to change the signage, that's one of the things is, what's going on in your courthouse? Is it easy to get around? And also, do you have multiple languages, and are they on your signs? Well, they weren't going to pay for signs, so we just printed it and stuck it up on the wall. You know, that's the way it goes. You do what you have to do until you can get it done. Um, that's what I would urge. Um, but it is important that we recognize, again, who is coming into our courthouse? And, 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 and don't forget, providers may have been victims themselves in the past. And I have had people privately tell me that they sometimes get triggered. So we want to make sure the environment is as calm and safe as it can be, and that we're not escalating them, that I'm not going to have a bailiff who outside of my presence is, is name-calling or escalating or hovering over somebody that brings back a memory from their childhood when they were hovered over like that. But the reason we want to have trauma-informed practices in our courthouses and in the offices where our children are and in our detention centers and where they have to meet with their juvenile probation officers is we want to be supportive. We want to meet the needs of our children and their parents in the condition that they're in and be supportive. And we can wrought tr change. They may not look so hot, and they may not act like they want to change, but that is, of course, a result of what happened to them, and we always must be reminded of that. Um, I did want to show you some changes that cover some of our courthouses. I'm going to try and stick here. Um, domestic violence cases. Domestic violence in any of your child welfare cases? Yeah. And when I did domestic violence injunctions, I was oh so vigilant about making sure people were separated and all this different stuff, except duh, when I had my trauma audit and they came and said, yeah, but you've got trauma, you've got domestic violence cases in dependency court, you're not keep taking, keeping an eye on them, and this is very unsafe. So without money, I grabbed my domestic violence um, and the sexual violence people and walked around with the clerk, one of the deputy clerks and we looked at the court and I said, what can we change? What can we change? Because they were getting followed up to fill out injunctions or they were being followed out of the courthouse. Very simple. We put in child-friendly things in the clerk's office. We put in blinds so they can't be there. We put in a door that, that locks and the respondents can't be following them in to fill out their injunctions. We designated separate waiting areas with instructions. All I did was ask the clerk, would you mind sending this out? A law student intern designed everything for me. You wait over here, you wait there. And they said, you know what, your security doesn't care. Nobody's walking around outside to make sure nobody's being intimidated before they come into court. So we took care of that and they got trained. And therefore, we hopefully made them feel safe and we reassure them in court, by the way, when and in writing, if you are afraid when you were here, you stop at security and you tell them and you can stay there until it's your turn to come. We don't want you intimidated. And my, in, in, in dependency cases, nobody leaves the courtroom until we make sure that we have a, 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 a victim that is safe and out of following from the uh, parking lot, because that's an issue as well. So this is some of our major signage that we've done. And then um, what the, we've got some paintings that have been put up. Go ahead and talk about them, That are some of yours, I believe. Okay. Judge Polson? Keep talking until it comes on. Okay, so <laughs> this one. All right, so I got the painting with the family there in the middle. So I went to a uh, family administrative uh, FLA FCC conference last year, and John Couch um, was there, and they had these paintings up, those two ones that are in the white frames, and they asked if anybody wanted those. They were painted by children in Tallahassee, and I said, I'll take them, and sure enough, they rolled them up and gave them to me, and then the county framed them and put them up for me. That's our parents' waiting room, and then our children's waiting room that's a little different. So. And then uh, the one in our courts is in the, what would be my upper right with all the paintings. Our clerk 
has the elementary school art teachers have rotating exhibits in our courthouse and they're on all of the hallways and they invite the children to come to the courthouse so it's a positive experience and they celebrate each time there are new pictures put up they have comment boxes um, for the children and it makes a big difference in the environment that's also um, we have a central area that we've managed despite all of our modifications to keep green and my JA keeps after them to make sure that it's trim that there's flowers there that they can sit out there and get a little peace a little mindfulness out there. Um, then we have, oh, there we go. This is um, our, now the bottom um, room, you want, I think that, is that you Judge Broom? Who's? That, that's our first, our first uh, week of it. Uh, it's been, had much added to it since then. We've got, is this since your consultation? Yes, it's since our consultation. We've added padding and we've got some other uh, playhouses and other things, but this is in our lobby area and actually uh, it worked out great for us, and I will tell you that um, all of the ideas that you see here are ideas that, uh, uh, as uh, Judge McPhail, my hero, says, we've uh, uh, stolen from other uh, other judges, uh, or in the name of research, taken from other judges. So, um, <laughs> and, and in our area there, that's a retired judge who's been on the bench. He still comes back after 40 years, but he loves art, and he's the one who painted the mural when we moved to a larger waiting area that's right at the entrance. It's such a positive thing. Our clerks, our women's club have adopted our children. And then this is, um, these are, I think, all from Tennessee, right? A, a wonderful judge, um, Michael, in Tennessee, he not only did it in the courthouse, he went to the juvenile offices, he went to child welfare, and he convinced them that they needed to be user-friendly. So that's one of my next steps I want to do. Imagine going there, what a difference it makes to um, have to have some heart-to-heart -heart conversations. This is in my chambers and in my courtroom. We have Mr. and Mrs. Bear that have been donated, and kids play all over them. Um, but we try to send positive messages. Uh, and, and people, will, as they're leaving, will go, boy, this looks different than any courtroom I've ever been in. Um, and then, of course, we have therapy dogs. And then we have, thanks to Judge Cohen's great leadership, our two-for-two two books, um, where we have um, the, you know, the caregiver gets a book, and the parent, and even little, of course, for the babies, because we're reading every day. And did you notice our, our plenary speaker this morning was talking about a lot of the, the science on what we're doing and being a, having trauma-informed practices, and that reading every day by phone to the child and reading to them during the visit with that book is key. And so we have stacks of those, and, um, and, and Dr. Graham keeps me in them as gifts. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Graham. Um, but we have um, our detention center, our, the children, did all of the paint, work, the paint and the design that they wanted in there, guided by our wonderful trauma-informed um, superintendents that we have out there. And we have a trauma-informed therapist on site there as well. And they have a dog therapy program, which makes a big difference. And if you didn't know it, by the way, uh, an a male who has been sexually molested, one of the best things you can do for them is give them a dog. And my boys that I know have been sexually molested just, they go, where's the dogs? Aren't they coming back this week? They love them. It, it makes a big difference. And then, of course, meeting people's needs, knowing what your resources are in your community. So when they're homeless, you know where to send them information, where they need to go find out where they can get free mobile medical, where they, need, they can get access to their um, getting their benefits. They can get washer and dryer, hot showers. We provide them with that. Um, it is important, of course, that sometimes it's they might be raising their voices and getting all aggravated. You just took my kids and you just read how they raised a, an air rifle at this child protective investigator. We have to remember that sometimes we have to give them what they need the most when it appears they deserve it the least. And we will not escalate them by continuing to say, you know, it's a, I, this is a bad day. What can I do to help you? We have to remember to engage and say, not assume that I can impose a case plan. What is the most important thing you think you need right now? And if they don't have a safe place to stay, that's what we better be working on instead of saying, take that parenting class. And as you can see, that's the last thing on the list we learned this morning. I think that was very important information. Um, but it is a balance, particularly in early childhood court, when we're focused on the first 1,000 days to balance helping that parent heal healing that parent relationship, having some patience, but still tr remembering to get to permanency. I do want to tell you that um, at the um, very end, I have some resources that you might want to take a look at. But you know, 
one at a time. There is a metamorphosis that's possible. We may be crawling as caterpillars when they're walking in our courtroom, but by the time we hope they leave, they have the opportunity to be free of their past and to have happiness in their life, whether it's with the child that has been taken from them or next time. Thank you very much for your attention.